I'm John Bennett, the Congregational Care Pastor here at Royal Redeemer. It's a joy to be with you here today, both in person and online. Grace, mercy, and peace to you from God the Father, through our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and in the power of the Holy Spirit. Amen. My dear friends in Christ, in addition to this being Memorial Day weekend, when we honor and remember those who died while serving in the military, today is designated in the church calendar as Holy Trinity Sunday. The doctrine of the Trinity is what uniquely identifies the Christian faith. And you may have noticed when we were uh, professing the Athanasian Creed uh, that the word Catholic is in there a lot. It's a small c, which means universal. It doesn't mean the Catholic Church. We begin worship and other services with the Trinitarian invocation in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Our sins are forgiven in the name of the Trinity. In the creed, all of our creeds, we profess our belief in the triune God. We're baptized in the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Spirit. When we're confirmed in our faith, we receive a blessing that's based on the Trinity. As we saw last Sunday, new members of the Royal Redeemer profess belief in the Triune God. And we just sang about the Trinity in the song, We Believe. Yet Jesus is never quoted as using the word Trinity, nor is that term specifically mentioned anywhere in the Bible. So why is belief in the Trinity so important to our lives as Christians? Well, the answer is in our title of our sermon today. The Holy Trinity is how God works. It's how he creates, how he saves, and how he sanctifies us. A question to consider today is this then. Do we need to understand the Trinity to experience God working in our lives? Please pray with me. Dear God, Father, Son, and Holy Spirit, give us eyes to see and ears to hear the importance of believing in the Trinity. And it's in your precious triune name that we pray. Amen. We're pretty familiar with what God does in our lives as the Father who creates us, as the Son who saves us. And, but what about the work of the Holy Spirit? What all does the Holy Spirit do? Well, Jesus gives us some insights into that in our gospel reading today. In verses 12 to 14 of John chapter 16, Jesus says this to his disciples. I still have many things to say to you, but you cannot bear them now. When the Spirit of truth comes, he will guide you into all the truth. For he will not speak on his own authority, but whatever he hears, he will speak, and he will declare to you the things that are to come. He will glorify me, for he will take what is mine and declare it to you. Jesus is saying that the Holy Spirit will lead them and us into a deeper understanding of God's truths. Our reading from Acts 2 this morning is an example of that happening. It occurred on the day of Pentecost right after Peter had received the Holy Spirit. You recall that before that, Peter and all the other disciples were kind of cowering up in the upper room in fear of the Romans because they were afraid the same thing was going to happen to them that happened to Jesus. But then all of a sudden, Peter received the Holy Spirit at Pentecost and he received a deeper understanding of the implications of Jesus' death and resurrection. And he was then emboldened by the Holy Spirit to preach that message to the crowd. We can infer from our gospel reading that Jesus is saying to us, when you don't understand something, it doesn't mean it's wrong. It may just mean that you aren't ready to understand it yet. Here's a simple illustration from math. If the only type of math we know is addition, we cannot understand how three ones could equal one, right? One plus one plus one does not equal one. We would prefer it. But when we learn multiplication, get a little older, we see that one times one times one does equal one. 
So three ones can equal one. In verse 15 of our gospel, Jesus says this, All that the Father has is mine. Therefore, I said that he, the Holy Spirit, will take what is mine and declare it to you. Notice all three persons of the Trinity are referenced there. The Father, the Son, and the Holy Spirit. But the Trinity was a new concept at that time, and the early church found itself in a conflict between its monotheistic principle, that is, the principle that God is one, that's even the, the Jewish confession of faith that's, that's called the Shema. I had to Google that to see how to pronounce it, Shema. And that says, Hear, O Israel, the Lord is our God, the Lord is one. You can also read that in Deuteronomy 6, 4, and 5. So there was a conflict between that and the Christocentric principle that Jesus is God. Some were arguing at the time that the oneness of God could not be compromised. So Jesus and the Holy Spirit could not be God. In an effort to articulate the truth of the Trinity, the church developed the Apostles' Creed in the second century. And they used 110 words to proclaim that belief. We use that creed, of course, in our non-communion services to profess our faith. Then in the fourth century, the Nicene Creed came along it was developed by the Council of Nicaea. It was convened to debate what was known as the Arian controversy. There was a guy named Arian who argued that Jesus could not be God because God would not have allowed himself to be crucified and die. So this heresy held that Jesus was created by God at the beginning as God's first creature. The church, on the other hand, argued that if Jesus was not God, then his sacrifice was not the perfect sacrifice which required his payment for our sin, which would mean that we're still lost in our sin. So this controversy was a big deal. It had eternal consequences. The council at Nicaea concluded that God exists as both a unity and a trinity. One God and three persons. The Nicene Creed uses carefully worded phrases to proclaim that Jesus is begotten of his Father before all worlds, begotten, not made, being of one substance with the Father. The distinction between begotten and made is crucial. In clarifying this, the Nicene Creed uses 245 words. That's over twice the number of words in the Apostles' Creed. We, of course, normally use that, except on uh, today, in our communion services. Then toward the end of the fifth century, the Athanasian Creed was written to further articulate the mystery of the Trinity. It uses 653 words, if you were counting them as we said it, to proclaim belief in the Trinity. And that's more than two and a half times the number of words in the Nicene Creed, and about six times the number of words in the Apostles' Creed. So it, it it's kind of like, at some point, you, you kind of want to say, okay, I got it, I got it. You can say, well, in case you didn't, here's something more to think about. Many churches use the Athanasian Creed on Trinity Sunday, as we did this morning. Since then, many have tried to understand the Trinity by using various analogies for the Trinity to explain how God could be one God in three persons. One analogy is that of a man who is at the same time a father, a husband, and a child to his parents. Each of those three rules, three roles, it's different, but it's all the same man. Another analogy is that of three states of matter, liquid, solid, and gas. For example, we have water, steam, and ice. All three have different physical properties, but they all have the same chemical formula. They're all H2O. All these attempts to understand the Trinity, though, using earthly analogies, at some point become inadequate. There's a great quote that's attributed to the Church Father Augustine. He said this, Anyone who denies the Trinity is in danger of losing their salvation, but anyone who tries to understand the Trinity is in danger of losing their mind. Martin Luther said this about the Trinity. 
The truth of the triune God is based on revelation, not on reason. One way that we can look at the Trinity is that it's how God functions to create and reconcile his creation to himself. God the Father is God in his creating mode. God the Son is God in his saving mode. And God the Holy Spirit is God in his sanctifying mode. As he gives us the gift of faith, lives in us, guides us into all truth, and changes us into the person he created us to be. But before we simplify it too much, remember all three persons of the Trinity are present and active in all three modes of how God works. So just so we think we've got it nailed down, uh, it gets kind of confusing again. Like they told us every day in seminary, God is God and you are not. Here's one of the best graphics that I've seen to illustrate the Trinity. It's called the shield of the Trinity. And it says this, the Father is God, the Son is God, the Holy Spirit is God, but the Father is not the Son, the Son is not the Father, the Son is not the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit is not the Son, the Holy Spirit is not the Father, and the Father is is not the Holy Spirit. It's kind of a diagram of the Athanasian Creed. So that clears it up, right? Okay, when we think of God working in our lives through the Trinity, we may think of what he's done in the past. God the Father created us. God the Son saved us. And God the Holy Spirit gave us the faith to believe. But the Holy Spirit is also working in and through us right now to reveal more of Jesus' truth to us and God's plan for our lives as we're ready to learn it. That's what Jesus was talking about in our gospel reading today. Have you ever read a passage from the Bible that you've read many times before and suddenly it takes on a whole new meaning? You see a depth of truth that you've never seen before in that. It even seems to apply directly to your current life situation. Has that ever happened to anyone? Happens all the time. But that's God, the Holy Spirit, leading you into the truths of God and teaching you things that you weren't ready to learn <clears throat> before. How about when a person comes into your life to fill a need that you have at just the right time that you need it? Or have you had a book on your shelf that for some reason you just couldn't get into? And then one day you picked it up and couldn't stop reading it because it was speaking directly to your life at the moment. That's the Holy Spirit guiding you into God's truth because you're now ready to hear it. And then God uses those times to grow you in your faith, to give you opportunities to tell others about God's love for them in Jesus. Fortunately, our Heavenly Father does not ask us to understand His triune nature. He simply asks us to trust in Him and leave the details to him. There's a great quote that uh, Pastor Ben shared with me from a pastor named Tyler Statton, and it's in a Bible study that's called, I'm not sure if you can see this, but it says, Praying like monks, living like fools. He says this, The Bible has not revealed a God that we can perfectly understand, but it has revealed a God we can perfectly trust. I remember once when I was sitting in the lab over in Blue Ash in the late 90s, where I worked as an analytical chemist before I went to seminary, I was trying to understand how God works through the Holy Spirit. I happened to look out the window and I saw some kids flying a kite. I think you have to click it. There we go. Flying a kite. And the thought occurred to me, next you don't need to understand everything about aerodynamics to fly a kite. You just hold the string, you run into the wind, and you experience the kite flying. I didn't know it at the time, but the Greek word pneuma, next click, pronounced with a silent P, I put the Greek uh, letters there just so you'd know what I was saying. <laughs> it's, uh, no, go back to it, there we go. It's, it's translated as the spirit of truth in our reading today, but it can also mean wind. As we heard last week, 
the Holy Spirit came at Pentecost like a mighty wind. It was as if the Holy Spirit was giving me the answer to our question for today about needing to understand the Trinity in order to experience God working in our lives. He was saying, you don't need to understand the Trinity to live as a Christian and experience God working in your life. You just believe and trust God's promises revealed in his word as one who was created by the Father, saved by the Son, and is in the process of being sanctified by the Holy Spirit. Then simply step out in faith when and where you sense him leading as you live out the love of the King, experiencing God working in your life, revealing his truths and plans for you, and reaching others with his love through you. Now may the grace of our Lord Jesus Christ, the love of God the Father, and the fellowship of the Holy Spirit be with you all, today and always, as you live out the love of the King. Amen.